Um, so uh, again, um, this is the ne next session of the series on liver transplantation on the LGS forum. It is an extremely interesting and pertinent topic and is in the form of a debate. I'm sure each one of us at uh, some stage uh, in our uh, surgical career and education has been in a quandary uh, and has needed to take the tough decision uh, whether to go uh, to the uh, go overseas and work and train or to stay back in India to, to again study further or work. But uh, again, I'm sure all of us would agree that it is not one factor, but a combination of social, financial and personal issues which uh, would have finally influenced our uh, choice uh, on the path which we uh, have taken. Um, the aim of uh, the uh, uh, debate is not to uh, provide an algorithm or an application checklist, which I'm sure is available in most official websites. We are not going to do that. The aim here is to uh, present to any surgical uh, fellow or, or, or a student who is indecisive as to which remains the best path to liver transplantation. And more importantly, the aim here is to uh, show the ground realities of each side of the coin. Um, now, uh, we have invited two of my esteemed uh, colleagues from uh, Professor Ella's team, both of whom are established transplant surgeons in their own right. Uh, even though their goal of uh, of being the transplant surgeons has been the same. They have chosen uh, uh, two uh, paths which, which are absolutely opposite to each other. One has, uh, has, has trained totally in India, while the other uh, has, has uh, done all the surgical training uh, overseas. The first speaker would be Dr. Ram Kiran, who did his uh, basic and higher surgical training in Hyderabad and a two-year transplant fellowship with the uh, Professor Ella. He has been part of Prof's team for the past five years. He has uh, now subspecialized into the donor operation in, a, in, a, in, in the LDLT and more recently further subspecializing into robotic donor hepatectomies. Now uh, Ram's skills are well known within the team and even Prof has commented more than once that Ram reminds him of a younger version of himself. Uh, I would say it's something akin to what Don Bradman said of Tendulkar. Need I say more about Ram? Um, on the other side of the boxing ring is Dr. Abdul. Uh, he did his MBBS from uh, Chennai and then he went on to do his PhD in liver bioengineering. He uh, entered into a run-through surgical training, which is very difficult to get into, I'm sure. Uh, all those who, are, who, who have tried to get in would know. And then uh, he did his FRCS and his CCT from Cambridge. He's also a fellow of the European Board of Surgery. Uh, Abdul has over uh, 75 publications uh, to his name and, and as a part of his training has done over 150 kidneys, 150 livers, 50 pancreas and over 50 intestinal transplants independently. Now with numerous awards and grants under his belt, I can go on and on. But to me, what stands out would be the fact that Abdul was Nobel laureate Stephen Hawking's teaching doctor. In, 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 a, in a short period in our unit, Abdul has established himself as an excellent surgeon. And, and I, I, I think uh, the, the, the two surgeons who will be talking are well matched. Um, on, on the uh, sidelines and on the bench, we have three very distinguished uh, surgeons. Uh, we have our own... Uh, a LGS, uh, uh, you know, make the, he's the mainstay of LGS, shall we say, uh, Do Dr. Ilango, then we have Dr. Pari and, and, and of course, uh, Dr. Vimal, who, uh, who was my teacher. Uh, all of whom uh, have taken the longest possible route to transplant training and success. They, uh, all these three surgeons have trained both in India and abroad. Now, it's something I confess I am guilty of as well. Um, now, their comments on why they did of what they did will definitely enrich this debate. So, uh, to, to um, go on to the debate now, as they say, the grass is greener on the other side, but is that really true? Uh, Ram, over to you. Uh, thank you, sir. I, I think we'll uh, get it from this. Let me just uh, share my screen. 
Dr. Ashwin has been a fantastic uh, senior colleague, and someone with uh, incredible knowledge, and uh, he's an excellent surgeon and a prolific publisher. Uh, he's been uh, a great help uh, for me all through my training. Uh, can you see the screen, sir? Yeah, yes. You can make it full screen. Yeah. And That full screen. Fine. Yeah, sure. So I'll I'll get into the topic now. Uh, so liver transplant training, India or abroad? Uh, I think the talk is mainly aimed at uh, current uh, training. Ram, sorry to interrupt you, but I think your audio is not um, very clear. Um, is uh, is very low. Sir? Yeah, and um, it's a little muted. Uh, is it better now? Is it better? Stuck up as well. Yeah. Is the audio any better? Yeah, better, better, yes. Uh, I think the discussion is mainly aimed at uh, trainees of general surgery or GI surgery who are interested to get into liver transplantation and uh, which is the best route for them to take in terms of uh, moving ahead. Uh, so there's several things to consider prior to getting into liver transplant training. Uh, the first and foremost would be to question oneself why transplantation? Uh, uh, transplantation is a, a fascinating field it's one of the pinnacles of uh, surgical training, surgical skill, and it's uh, it's a very rewarding field. It's very tough, but also very rewarding once you get through it. Uh, so it's important to first uh, make sure you're you're really interested in it, you're passionate about it. Uh, only then you can uh, reap all the rewards from transplantation. Um, once you are sure of that, uh, you need to look into your areas of interest. Whether you're interested only in transplantation, or you also like to do GI surgery and HPV surgery, or what combination of these things. Uh, again, it, all these things might depend on your place of future practice, where you would settle, whether it's in India or abroad, uh, whether you're going to settle in a big city or in a smaller city or a town. Uh, these things uh, do matter when you decide to train yourself, because what you want to train in uh, will influence your future practice. Again, uh, liver transplantation is something which will make you adapt to a new lifestyle. Uh, you have very odd working hours, prolonged working hours. Your training may be of a long duration, anywhere between two to five years. Uh, you must learn to work as a part of a team. Uh, maybe in the future, you might want to build your own team. So you must be a team player. Uh, you might lead the team, uh, take all the members of the team with you. So uh, it is something to understand. And all these things should be uh, in your mind before you uh, get into liver transplant training. So what are the different components of training we should look at for getting into a training program. Uh, uh, surgical skills, I'm sure everybody thinks of that, but there's a lot more to transplant than surgery. Uh, it's important to uh, understand and learn transplant hepatology, uh, management of a patient with chronic liver disease, somebody who's on a wait list waiting for an organ. Um, you might, might or might not always have a good hepatologist with you during your uh, practice. So it's important to understand the uh, need, uh, all, all the concepts of hepatology before uh, you uh, call yourself a transplant surgeon. Um, perioperative management, which includes the concept and the art of immunosuppression, is important to learn. Uh, you need to understand and identify the complications. Uh, and also, it's important to learn the long term management of a transplant recipient uh, because uh, patients will be followed up with the surgeon most of the time. And with or without a hepatologist, you must be able to understand the long term implications of transplant and learn to manage them. Of course, surgical techniques are important to learn. Uh, many things that you would have learned in your general surgery or gay surgery might have to unlearn and relearn uh, newer techniques, newer skills. You will standardize these techniques with time, achieve finesse, and then uh, go on to innovate new techniques uh, as you progress through your uh, transplant uh, training and practice. Uh, again, pediatric hepatology is something uh, that is not uh, available everywhere. Uh, if you are interested in that, then uh, that's a completely different subfield of transplantation where might have to learn a lot about uh, pediatric hepatology and pediatric transplantation. So these are all uh, the different things you would uh, probably see before getting into a training program. Uh, so learning from a cadaver transplant program and a living donor liver transplant program, um, they are similar yet very different. Uh, you can learn several things from both, uh, which may have uh, a common ground. Uh, things like immunosuppression, transplant management, many of the concepts uh, are definitely the same. But there are certain things you would learn exclusively in a, in a disease trans, uh, donor transplant program. Uh, there are several things which are exclusive to a living donor transplant program. 
things like uh, organ allocation policy, uh, management of a patient in the wait list, uh, the logistics uh, of multi-organ retrieval. You might have to go for a retrieval, interact with the several team members of uh, retrieval surgeons of different uh, specialties, uh, organizing the whole thing and getting an organ KPA back, uh, assessing the graph, uh, PDL team plantation technique. All these things would be something you would learn only from a cadaver training program and not from a living donor uh, program. Uh, in advanced training, maybe about six liver transplantation, um, graft dysfunction, graft failure may be slightly more common in single donor transplant. So management of those things uh, would be more commonly learned in a new training, uh, disease donor training program. Uh, also, uh, hands-on training-wise, uh, multi-organ harvest is something that's one of the first things you would uh, get to do in a training fellowship. So that is something you would uh, get into and implantation of a DDLT graft might be slightly easier than a living donor transplantation. So uh, again, that is something you would get to do earlier if that's part of the training program. Uh, on the other hand, in the living donor setting, you have uh, things like donor selection, um, uh, donor assessment and workup. Here you don't have a, a organ allocation or a wait list. You have one donor for your recipient and you have to work him up for your recipient. Uh, uh, you have to have thorough understanding of surgical anatomy of the liver, biliary anatomy, vascular anatomy, and various techniques of harvesting uh, the liver grafts from right lobe to the left lateral segment to left lobe, right posterior, all different techniques, uh, which is again now advanced into minimal invasive surgery, laparoscopic, robotic uh, techniques of uh, graft harvest. Uh, all these things are again exclusive to living donor transplant. Uh, coming to the recipient, uh, the deconstruction. Can I just interrupt you? Uh, I think yes, isn't very clear so if you can just come a little closer yeah I'll... and uh, uh, and and it uh, you might want to switch off your video and we could try if it's because of a low bandwidth that it can be audio uh, or um, yeah yeah i think i'll switch off the videos is it any better sir yeah uh, we'll just try with this and see how it is yeah let's see uh, so, in the living donor setting, the uh, reconstruction is much more complex than the disease donor transplant. Uh, you have various issues like uh, portal hemodynamics, small for size syndrome. All these things would be exclusive to living donor transplant, which you may not learn much about in a disease donor transplant setting. Um, so, what's the scenario in India? Uh, is there a need for more liver transplant surgeons? Uh, I would say definitely yes. Uh, there's a huge population of chronic liver disease patients who are waiting for. Uh, liver transplant there's a big dearth of uh, liver transplant uh, organs the liver organs liver transplant uh, performing centers and surgeons so it would be uh, very useful for our country to have more surgeons so definitely there is a need um, there are a number of center of centers of excellence in our country uh, maybe around 12 to 15 centers which are doing about more than 50 uh, transplants per year and uh, all of these centers have one or two training positions per year um, uh, comparing north and south in centers who have a predominantly living donor based uh, training in the north, uh, maybe around 95% of their transplants would be uh, living donor uh, transplants, whereas in the south, uh, anywhere between 15 to 20% of the transplants are uh, disease donor transplants. So uh, if you get into training, this is something that you need to keep in mind. And most of these uh, high volume centers would also offer additional HPP surgery uh, experience. So um, again, uh, that is something where you would be trained in, in all of these uh, centers. And all these centers also perform pediatric transplantation. So uh, these are an all-in-one kind of training centers, which you have uh, all the phases of transplantation and HPP surgery covered uh, in, in one center. Uh, so looking at training abroad, uh, what are all the things that you, uh, I, I'm sure Dr. Abdul, my colleague, will be talking in more detail about this. Uh, but I would just like to highlight a few points. Um, the pathway for training is generally more uh, complicated. Uh, you might have to give additional examination, additional uh, qualifications before getting into uh, training in uh, several other countries. Uh, again, in, in training abroad, there is a difference between uh, Eastern and Western uh, countries. Uh, countries like Korea, Japan, uh, in the East would again perform more uh, living donor transplants. Uh, and the training there is generally uh, in the form of observerships rather than uh, full time training fellowships. Uh, whereas in the West, it's predominantly uh, disease donor transplant, again, uh, Europe, uh, UK, or US, uh, all these places. Um, so the, the training would be more of DDLT, and that too in multi-organ transplant, where you would be 
pain to uh, liver transplant, kidney transplant, pancreas, small bowel transplant surgery, rather than a exclusive transplant and liver transplant and HPV. Uh, so each one has its own advantages, which I'll come to a bit later. Um, and and many many countries do have specialized centers for pediatric transplantation. So uh, you may not have the pediatric transplantation as a part of uh, of the main center. So uh, depending on where you're trained, you may or may not be exposed to pediatric transplant. Again, because uh, each country is different, you have different organ allocation policies, uh, which may not be same as in our country. Uh, you have different patient profiles, their ethnicity, social and cultural norms may be very different. Uh, clinical scenarios may be very different. Uh, etiologies of the disease, infection rates, antibiotic policies, uh, the general practice uh, in the hospital may be very different from what we follow in our centers here. Uh, 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 certain countries in Europe, and in the East may have language and cultural barriers. So uh, I'm sure in nowadays these are not big problems, but but it's still something to um, uh, look at. Uh, cost implications are again a big factor uh, in most countries in Europe and in the US. Maybe the, um, the factor of cost may not uh, come when you look at uh, treating patients. Uh, whereas in India, any complication or any additional intervention to a patient. Uh, would uh, have huge cost implications. Uh, many patients in most instances would not be able to afford uh, extra treatment. So uh, cost is something that comes up in the decision tree uh, all the time uh, for our practice, which may not be the same when you're training uh, or when you're practicing abroad. And a lot of personal hurdles uh, with family, taking your family there or leaving your family there. Uh, I'm sure uh, many of you would have faced that when you went on to train abroad. So these are all the various Things that would uh, that you would face when training abroad, uh, but obviously uh, all this uh, is worth it in a certain way uh, because uh, the work ethic, the work ethic is vastly different when you work in uh, other countries. Uh, I'm not saying it's any lesser here, but uh, from my experience, from the surgeons that I've seen, uh, people who have trained abroad uh, really have a much stronger work work ethic, uh, more disciplined, and uh, uh, I think uh, the, uh, it is much. Uh, Better than what we have here. Uh, definitely, the outlook gets more broader. Your horizon is much wider. You meet a lot of people. You work in a lot of different cultures in a different uh, uh, settings. So you are a, more of a world citizen, and and your uh, outlook really improves. And this alone is is actually enough factor for you to consider working or training abroad. Um, and the research opportunities are very good. Um, and nowadays in India, it's no less. But uh, but the facilitation for your research support system for your research, I would say, is uh, much better in, a, in the West compared to what's, what it is in India. And also the training is much more structured. So uh, what you're expected to learn and expected to perform at the end of your fellowship is much more structured and clear uh, when you train uh, in certain centers, uh, whereas in India, it's not uh, so much so. Uh, so comparing uh, Indian training with, with this background, uh, training in India is much more direct. So directly get into your transplant training without uh, having to give any uh, additional qualifying exams. Uh, in fact, nowadays there are several MCH and DNB centers uh, which offer liver transplant exposure. So uh, for example, for me, I, I did my general surgery in uh, Hyderabad in Usmania Medical College. Uh, after that, I, I was interested in GI surgery. So I got into uh, DNB, GI surgery in the global hospital in Hyderabad. Uh, at that point of time, uh, about eight, nine years ago, uh, Dr. Rela used to come to Global Hospital Hyderabad and operate twice a week. Uh, he used to do a living donor, pediatric transplantation, and then advanced HPV operation. Uh, we were really fascinated and really impressed by the way he used to operate, which uh, was a great inspiration for me to uh, choose liver transplant as a career option. So uh, many many centers actually have uh, DNB programs and MCH programs uh, where you can have liver transplant exposure from an early part of your uh, um, of your training so that uh, you have a head start. Uh, we have world-class surgeons in India. Uh, they're no less than any surgeons anywhere else in the world. Uh, most of these surgeons are again trained in, in all parts of the world and they have come back. So automatically they bring their uh, world-class experience to India. So you can learn uh, what they have learned here without needing to travel the world. And most of our centers are high volume centers where you train and all of these institutes again offer multidisciplinary training, including pediatric transplantation and HPV surgery. So 
you get comprehensive training in most centers where you have training programs uh, research opportunities again are no less we have fantastic publications coming out of all the big centers in india uh, all the time so so we are not lagging behind in uh, any of those things we have a number of foreign surgeons uh, coming to india to get trained um, again i would say like the, on the flip side the training here is not so structured uh, you might have to take more time uh, to spend more time in each uh, training unit before you uh, achieve what you really uh, set out for and again hands on training uh, is not great because most of the high volume centers are uh, uh, private uh, enterprises uh, and the patients pay huge amounts of money to uh, get their treatments there so uh, hands on training takes a back seat uh, in these centers to, to, so that could uh, you might have to spend a much longer period in uh, your training to get into hands on uh, training uh, one other advantage is an extended uh, mentorship uh, that can happen so uh, somebody who is trained in a training center in india can uh once they go back to their place and set up their transplant program uh, you have your teachers you have your uh, senior colleagues uh, with you in in your parent center they can offer you a lot of help uh, we had one surgeon uh, named dr manoj who used to train under professor rela and now uh, he's back in pune his, his uh, hometown he set up a transplant program there and dr rela offers his uh, help to him whenever required so that is something that uh, you can have in terms of extended mentorship when you train in india and set up your practice in your own again you would be catering to your uh, local population you would understand your local policies better your local practices better and while you're in training you can uh, have a good outreach to your community of doctors and patients um, while you're training itself so by the time you set up your practice you're already in touch with uh, a number of your local surgeons and you have a patient base built up uh, while you're in training itself so this would all be uh, good advantages of uh, training in india the next uh, question i would like to address is um, multi organ transplant training or liver transplant plus hpb surgery training uh, it's not always so uh, clearly different um, uh, when you learn about liver transplantation you learn about concepts of immunosuppression long term post transplant management uh, all of these things uh, you're always already halfway through learning about uh, all solid transplant uh, uh, systems because they would be very similar for pancreas or small bowel or kidney transplantation so you are already well equipped to understand and perform other transplantations um, pancreas and small bowel transplant are uh, evolving in our country so somebody who is trained in that would have an advantage in terms of uh, performing these uh, transplants uh, kidney transplant anyway has been uh, taken over by urology nephrology colleagues so it may not be a big scope there uh, on the other hand uh, liver transplant surgeons are better equipped to Uh, tackle uh, advanced uh, hpb cases uh, difficult uh, liver tumors urinary tumors would be uh, much easily handled by uh, someone who's trained in uh, living donor transplant uh, advanced resections and reconstructions vascular resections would be uh, more easily done by somebody who's trained in uh, living donor liver transplant so each one has its advantages and disadvantages so uh, that is something for you to keep in mind when you choose a training uh, program is gi surgery training necessary this is again a very common question that is posed by trainees uh, i wouldn't say it is uh, mandatory but the transplant act uh, doesn't mandate you to have a gi surgery uh, as a qualification if you are a general surgery trained uh, surgeon and you have 3 years post ms experience in in the said specialty and you have one more year of training in the organ transplant specialty that you're good to go uh, to have uh, a training program here um, so but various uh, fellowships have eligibility as ga surgery uh, to get into the training program um, but i would say it's not uh, mandatory uh, however you should never consider ga surgery training as uh, a training from sorry uh, liver transplant training as a training from your basics uh, for somebody who already has a fair understanding of uh, hepatobiliary physiology uh, pathology and surgical principle uh, liver transplant training is just an additional uh, fine tuning of their and understanding uh, different concepts so somebody with a ga surgery training uh, would be much better equipped to take on liver transplantation training rather than somebody who comes directly from general surgery uh, part so i would uh, say that the ga surgery is not mandatory but it is i would say it is recommended to get into before uh, going on into liver transplant training so looking forward we have uh, we can have multi center training collaborations under the aegis of the 
the liver transplant society of india uh, you have various training centers in india with uh, each with its own uh, advantages and disadvantages so you could uh, work in a ldlt center uh, train for pediatric transplantation in another center uh, go for a observership for a disease donor transplantation in another, another center uh, uh, you could hop on to several centers within india and get uh, a well rounded training Uh, in our country itself uh, dissemination of liver transplantation into teaching institutions the big government institutions in all the state uh, that would uh, help in training a much more number of surgeons uh, it would make liver transplant accessible to a wider population which is really need of the day a uh, lot of patients suffering from lack of access uh, financially or uh, not having a center offering liver transplantation in place so we need more surgeons and more centers uh, taking over liver transplantation the need of the day and you have hpb and liver transplant as a separate specialty either an mch or it can be uh, moving forward this would be something to look at because uh, you would have more training uh, getting exposed to liver transplant and hpb at, uh, at an earlier part of their uh, career uh, ilbs offers an mch in uh, liver transplant and hpb so uh, this is something that should be uh, uh, more and more common in the future and uh, virtual learning uh, is the new norm now Uh, with fantastic uh, forums like living uh, like learning dental surgery uh, we have experts from all over the country and all over the world who can teach us uh, writing in our uh, in our uh, living room so we don't have to travel the world the world is our uh, fingertips now uh, if you have a rover attending a grand rounds half way around the world you don't really have to go there you can rover there so uh, i think with virtual learning uh, it really um, uh, you can sit at home and learn all the things all over the world and get trained in centers in india uh, so i would say uh, that, that that that's what my take would be uh, so i i thank uh, learning general surgery uh, team to uh, host this uh, wonderful series of uh, lectures uh, i think the picture says it all uh, maybe 10 years before uh, we would we would still be lacking uh, in terms of uh, liver transplant training but now i think we are the best in the world uh, and our training uh, is no less than anywhere else in the world uh, Uh, i would end with this thank you uh, over to dr rashmi uh, yeah uh, excellent argument uh, from your side ram abdul uh, over to you uh, would you like to present your views and then we can take uh, questions after you you finished your talk dr rashmi can you hear me well yeah okay right i think uh, first of all i would Well, I want to thank uh, Ashwin and uh, Dr. Pata for this wonderful uh, opportunity, and I think uh, uh, the others who are moderating the session as well. Um, I think, I mean, Ashwin, Ashwin already uh, said that I think I was born and uh, brought up in Chennai, um, and uh, and quite quite after my MBBS, I think about 13 days after I finished my house surgeonship, I had already uh, gone to gone to UK. I think so. I was sort of well organized, and I was uh, thinking about going to UK. quite from the beginning i think i'm the reason i'm saying all this to start with is that i think there are quite a few people uh, who are on uh, who, who, are, who are listening to this or watching this who actually want to uh, know whether it is the right choice to think about uh, abroad um, as i was at that time i think uh, i'm sure i'm sure people are still confused whether it is the right thing to do uh, is uk the right thing so what i'm going to do is i think i'm going to um, i mean um, although although my job was to talk about abroad UK is what I have experience for. So I'm going to talk about uh, talk about UK. I think Ram did a fant fantastic job uh, job to talking about the basics of transplants. I'm not going to go into that. And um, uh, why do we, why do we need to try train in transplant? I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to specifically talk about why 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 need to train uh, abroad with with more emphasis on UK perspective. So I think I mean what what I'm going to be touching upon is I think first thing is to understand uh, the UK training pathway. Uh, how long does it take to train in uk and what all you need to do and i think people always talk about i think even ram commented on it he said that uh, it is a structured training abroad uh, what is it all about i think we need to we need to exactly know so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you some snippets of from my from my cv from my curriculum vitae to understand what exactly structured training is all about and i think i mean is uk training a complete package uh, i think by the end of this lecture i'm sure uh, by by the end of this talk i'm sure you would uh, agree that it is a complete package Much better than what uh, India offers at the moment. 
I think, I mean, the other question is why does UK uh, not do LDLT? Because that would actually not have this uh, discussion at all. You would, have, you would be quite happy to go to uh, go to UK or abroad uh, for, for liver transplant training of other countries or for uh, LDLT as well, because that's that's where the crux is. I think uh, there is something different uh, in abroad, which which I think India, India seems to be much better in. And I think I'm, I've also, what I've done is I've asked some of my liver transplant colleagues, I've done a mini survey, uh, about 10 of my colleagues, I'm going to show their perspective as well, because it's not only important to understand my perspective, but some perspective from the seniors and, and, and some junior consultants from the specialty. So I think this is just a brief uh, diagram of uh, what the UK training is all about. So after you finish your medical school, it's probably relevant for us. Uh, what you do is two years of foundation uh, year training, like what you do as a house surgeon in India, you do two years in uh, UK, so that's your foundation training. Then you uh, go on to uh, do a, a surgical training year one and two, which are actually your core surgical training. This is when after the first two years is when you actually uh, enter into, when you actually decided that you want to do surgery and, and, and you enter into core surgical training. Then following that, you have an interview where uh, it is decided whether uh, what, what higher specialty training you want to take. So that is your ST3 surgical training year three to surgical training year eight, which is six years. So that's basically uh, eight years of surgical training. And following that, I think either you can become a clinical consultant or you, uh, or, or, or you can go on Go and do a post CCT year, which a CCT is nothing but a certificate of completion of training. So you do a post CCT year, where where you can do a fellowship. Uh, for example, let's say you want to do a fellowship in robotic surgery, so you can do a fellowship, one year fellowship, uh, either in UK or or go somewhere else like New Zealand or Australia, and then come back to UK and join as a consultant. Uh, but the catch here is that you, I think, you, if you have to do a high end specialty like let's say HPB surgery or a transplant surgery, you need to do a, you need to do research. You need to do either a couple of years of MD, uh, a doctor of medicine or, or three years uh, as a PhD, if it all goes well. These can get extended, but again, these might be, I mean, these are currently difficult to get as well because NHS is running out of funding. It's not easy, easy to get it. So I think the other, the other thing I think, so, so to, if you, if you do a MD, it will take you about 12 years if it all runs smoothly to become a clinical consultant in UK. If at all uh, you do a PhD, then it will take about uh, 13 years or, or longer if you do a fellowship. So I think the training is long in UK. There's no doubt about it. There's another pathway called as an academic consultant where you do a 50% clinical work and 50% academic work, work. I'm not going to go into the details of it. So I think to start with, this is basically the UK, UK training program. I think so what I have done in terms of my training, I've spent about 13 years in UK, uh, starting from 2006 to 2018. And I've been with uh, Professor Rayla for the last uh, uh, 15 months. Um, I think if you look into it specifically, I think I've done, um, I think my start with the, the transplant, the, the first few years is basically rotating between sort of various uh, domains of general surgery, like cardiothoracic surgery or pediatric surgery, upper GI colorectal vascular. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure this happens in India as well when you do an MS. Um, but I think my first uh, sort of introduction to do transplant happened in around 2009 when I, when I joined uh, Liverpool as my first year of my registrar. That's when I started liking transplant and decided this is what I want to do. Then I went to Leeds and did my PhD in liver transplant because I didn't want to settle with renal transplant. So I did my, uh, my, my, my research in uh, liver reengineering where, where we took the sort of human livers and, and uh, took all the cells out and then repopulated it with uh, fresh hepatocytes. Then subsequently, I went, went on to do my, uh, my higher surgical training. When you do a higher surgical training, first two years or three years of your training is general surgery. And then only the last two years or three years is your higher surgical training. I was lucky enough to get at least three years of that uh, in, 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 in Cambridge, which actually is the only center in the UK which, does, which, is, which, is, um, which can do multivisceral transplant, which can do uh, a combination of small bowel transplant and a liver transplant, a pancreas transplant all together in one. So it is the only one day center. So I was, I was quite lucky enough to, to go into that. So I think, I mean, as I said, I think people talk about structured training. One of the problems is that there's no, nobody is able to explain what exactly it's all about. I think what I, I'm going to go into a bit of uh, basics of, uh, of the structure training in the UK, what it offers. Then I'm going to touch upon uh, the liver transplant site, what UK offers in terms of liver transplant. So I think the reason why it is called as a structure training is that because there are um, everything for what you do from the beginning. So I think this page goes further down up to 2006 when I first started. Um, you can actually go into this website and you can actually see what I have done from the beginning, from 2006 until 2018, every bit of my progress has been not, not noted down. So people will know what people have 
feedback about me, how, how was my training in the initial years, how was I, how have I progressed? So you can look at everything. I, I still have access to that, uh, to, the, to this if somebody wants to look, in, look into it in future. So I think this website will have everything what I've done in terms of my assessments, in terms of my prizes, let's say, in terms of my publication, everything is there in this website. So this is basically uh, which people can actually assess you every six months and see whether you progress to the next level or you get demoted and continue to do the same same six months again. Uh, so it's quite a, quite a structured training. I think so this is basically one page where you actually look at the feedback, so the multi-source feedback, MSF at the bottom of the page. So I think from the, from the initial years, 2006 to 2018, you can look at each and every uh, one of my one of my feedback. If somebody has told negative, it will get highlighted in it. So it's very important to actually. I think when Ram said that people are much more uh, ethically right or or are hardworking or, or should say they, I think more more organized. It comes it comes with all the sort of stringent measures where people are really watching you and want to make sure that you get 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 all the training, all the training that is needed. So I think now I'm going to just show you a snippets of my CV to understand what the what structure training is all about. It's not about, I think Ram also pointed this, he said that surgical training is not the only thing. So you need to have a, a component of other things that actually makes makes a complete package. And I think I, I still sort of uh, want to say that UK, UK gives provides you the complete package. So I think first thing is your mandatory logbook. I'm, I'm sure I'm told this is this is quite a difficult thing in India. People don't really maintain their logbook. So if you just look at the bottom of the page, it will tell me. I mean, from 2006 to 2018, how many operations I've been part of. Um, um, I mean, in terms of this, is just a small snippet uh, from my CV. So if you look at my, I mean, the, the different courses. I think I've just highlighted the 15 transplant-related courses. So these are available. These are you're not you're you're not. I mean, you you are basically expected to do this. Some of these are mandatory. Some of these are done because of my own interest. So some of the, I mean, majority of these are sponsored, so you don't have to spend for it. So there is an, uh, an effort from the UK training program to actually train people and give them, give them these academic and generic, generic skills. So I don't want you to read read all the slides. I think it's just it's just a, it's just a brief of what I think. I mean, research and publications again. There is there is a bit of a pressure on everyone to actually publish and to and to sort of uh, follow evidence based. And I've done that as well. I've got more than uh, 100, 100 research items and continue to do so with uh, with Prof's team as well. Um, research grants. There is emphasis to actually take grants from the charitable uh, trust and from the other uh, sort of government organization to see whether you can do sort of hardcore research. I think the first one is nearly sort of 200 uh, two, two, two crore worth grant which i took for uh, took, took for doing a randomized control trial on portal clamping versus sprinkle manual in, in leads so something there is a lot of emphasis emphasis on it some people do it some people don't do it but the mandatory thing is that you should at least have uh, three first author publications you should have had some grants and and you should have done sort of tick, tick mark some of these courses so I think presentations at various international platform, again, it is mandatory to have at least three presentations by the time you complete your, uh, your, your uh, training. So I've, I've, done, I've done various, this is just, uh, again, a short, uh, short snippet. Um, teaching juniors during my training, there is emphasis on teaching um, your juniors. It's not only about training yourself, but you also need to teach. So I think quite early from my uh, career, I think even when I started becoming a registrar, I, at, a, at a quite a sort of at an MS, let's say at an MS level, I was I was training people on doing various things because at that time, I had the surgical skills and I and I wanted to teach my medical students. So I think there's an emphasis on that. Crisp course is basically the critically uh, ill ill surgical patient and then the basic surgical skills. There's lots of other courses there. There is an emphasis to go and teach on them, and you're not forced on doing it. People are are given right, and you're actually teaching at the level grounds with the senior consultant, which I'm sure might uh, doesn't happen in in, in India. So I think there is also sort of emphasis on management training because the emphasis is to uh, become a leader, not only a clinician, but you need to be a leader in what you do. So I think there are some courses that they do to, to, to help you a project plan or a manage or, or, or do a leadership course. Um, the, the right box actually shows, I think Cambridge also had a mini MBA, which I think I was fortunate to be selected based on an interview. And I went on to actually uh, uh, do, do a managerial load in education and steady leave uh, department in the in the in the in the change. So I think there are lots of emphasis on doing things uh, and and actively uh, and actively following this. 
So I think overall, I think uh, you, you all should agree from what I have presented so far that it is a complete package. It doesn't only give you the operative skills, which again, you get assessed uh, every day. In theater, you, you have an assessment. There is a procedural based assessment. Nobody is just, I mean, you can't just tie wrong that and then get away, get away from it. So you, you are being assessed. Uh, in terms of the non-operative skills, I think there are lots of uh, emphasis on academic and generic, uh, generic uh, training. I think so academic skills, audit, research, publishing, grant, which I already covered. Generic skills, like things like coming communication, leadership, management, organization, teamwork, learning, teaching, ethics, everything is covered. So there is nothing, I mean, you go to, you go every day working, not only to work, but you, you get taught on, taught on these skills without being pressurized. And it just automatically comes to you by the end of your uh, training. So I think now going into the sort of the context of our talk, which is uh, what UK offers for liver transplant training. Um, I mean, uh, these are the these are the seven centers which do liver transplants in UK, and I I think this is this this summary is not available anywhere. I think so I've, I've taken some efforts to take it from various uh, various sort of uh, documents from the UK. So I think, I mean, the top ones which do liver transplant are the Kings and Birmingham. There's no doubt about it. They also do some pediatric transplant, including these. Um, and uh, these are the year, uh, annual numbers for these transplant centers. And also I have, I have, I have highlighted the different organs that, that, uh, that they do other than the liver. Uh, Ram pointed out that, uh, that the training in multi-organ transplant is needed or not. I've not covered HPV in this because I didn't want to confuse the issue. So I've stuck to the liver transplant. All, all of these centers also have HPV. So you can go in and join into a theater like like Cambridge. I, if I have a free day, I'll go into HPV theaters. There's nobody stopping you. There is there is an emphasis on training. If you're free, you can go in and join. There's no problems at all in that. And also, I think the other aspect that people like about UK training is organ retrieval, because that is something that is not there in India. And I have given in, given you the numbers for the DBD and the DCD, which is not practiced in, practiced in India. There are huge numbers as well. It's important to learn the DCD as well, because I'm, I'm sure in future, maybe maybe a long time from now, you will have uh, DCDs coming up in India as well, if, the, if things get more uh, systemic and uh, systematic. I think the right column, which is outside the table, I've just highlighted the big numbers. Which, which is a combination of the organ retrieval, other organs transplanted, adult transplant, pediatric transplant, all together. So I think in terms of uh, the numbers, uh, Cambridge, Birmingham, Kings, and Leeds are all sort of big transplant units. So I think this gives you a rough summary for somebody who's currently doing an MCH, who wants to train in, in these centers. I would recommend going to these four centers, not anywhere else. I think at the bottom of it, I've said like, uh, what's happened to the UK liver transplant list. I'm going to show you a summary of how the liver transplant, how many patients are active on the list. So not a huge number compared to what in India, it will be somewhere around 10,000. So I think we're not, we're not going to go into this. So I think there's a 20% increase in the number of patients from previous years. So not a sort of very moderate increase. Uh, so you might not see a big change in the active uh, liver transplant waiting list, but that doesn't mean that you don't get trained. I think that there's going to be liver transplant all the time. It's not going to be that it's going to be all medically treated. So I think, I mean, if you're, if you're training, if you want to go to UK and you say like, oh, my liver, my, my, my LDLT skills will uh, vanish and I might not, uh, if I come back a year or two later, I might not have that. I might, I might, I might get some experience from a pediatric or a, or a split liver. I'm going to explain more about pediatric later. Split livers aren't a lot. So about, about 70 split livers, uh, which is about uh, roughly about 8 percentage of the transplants, DDLT transplants are, are, are in, the, in the last year. Where, uh, where, where split liver transplants, out of which 76% were uh, all liver lobe transplant activity, the rest were pediatric, uh, pediatric transplants. So I think, so, so, this, so if you're thinking, if, you're, if your expectation is that you might compromise by getting involved with a split liver transplant or a pediatric transplant, I think you have to think otherwise. So what was the sort of the numbers in terms of UK adult liver transplant, uh, trans transplant? I think, I mean, the reason why I have put this slide is that because people will have to know what is the current status. They don't want to know what has been, has the center been performing uniformly and is it getting better or, or are the numbers going down? So I think if the, the red highlighted one I've shown, the 800 uh, transplants, adult liver transplants done in the UK in the previous year, um, combining, combining all seven centers together, Birmingham numbers are increasing, Cambridge persistently increasing, Edinburgh increasing, uh, King's College have been sort of pretty much stable. Leads have come down. I think they had an audit uh, the previous year where there were some problems and then they had to sort of cut down on a few uh, on selecting, uh, be more selective in, 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 in selecting their patients. I think, I mean, so, so I think apart from, uh, let's say, Newcastle, the other centers are doing fairly good number of transplants. And the number of fellows in these uh, transplant units who actually want to do liver transplant will be 
anywhere around two to three. So you are actually uh, compete. Uh, you, you're not competing with the huge, huge numbers. Maybe in Kings and Birmingham, you might have more. Uh, let's say six people who are really focused, uh, uh, but 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 not not. So I think you are basically uh, dividing all the participants into into that. In terms of the pediatric liver transplant, I don't think UK offers a lot. I think uh, the, the number of pediatric liver transplants done done around, around 70 transplants in a year. I think only about 15 were uh, living donor transplants, the rest were disease donor transplants, and the numbers based on the different uh, different different centers. So I think, I mean, uh, uh, Kings actually do more than uh, Birmingham and Birmingham and Leeds. So not a lot of pediatric uh, liver transplants and and, 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 and and the LDLT numbers aren't huge. So I think in terms of what I have done, I think Ashwin sort of quoted a few numbers. I might be grossly wrong from, uh, from what he said, probably he, he sort of overrepresented my numbers, but these are these are the numbers. I think liver transplant have been sort of involved in 138 of them. I think fairly the, the training is not bad. I think you have to be persistent. You have to put your efforts. I have to say the last eight eight months before I left the UK, I was involved in nearly sort of 75. I stepped into 75 liver transplant and I was given hepatic heart in at least uh, 30 of them so that's that's i think if you put the effort because i had to do a couple of back-to-back -back transplants uh, to, to to put the effort not sleep for 36 hours before going to transplant so lots of efforts you need to take so i think the good thing about cambridge i think this is a photo with roy roy khan holding a liver which is the sculpture in uh, in in, in adam brooks hospital so i think the good thing about cambridge is that it offers a variety it offers liver transplant it gives me training in multi cell transplant kidney transplant pancreas transplant kidney transplant majority of our independent ones multi-organ retrieval, about 150 of them, small bowel retrieval, laparoscopic donor nephrectomy, vascular access for dialysis, you name it. I think there's, there's skills everywhere in Cambridge. And, and there's no on-calls, no duty goes without actually operating in, uh, in Cambridge. And, and, and obviously assessment of these patients and all sort of add, adds to huge numbers. Um, LDLT uh, in UK, why, why aren't they doing? Are they bad surgeons? Are they not technically confident? What exactly is the problem? I think if you look at the right side, um, that tells you, I think the median, let's say, I think when I started my research in 2000, uh, sort of when I finished sort of 2013, the waiting list for uh, liver in UK was about 138 days. And the current waiting list is only about 99 days. So it is coming down. The reason it's coming down is that things like hepatitis C treatment, uh, think, uh, things like sort of metabolic disorders, uh, having having sort of better other 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 options, and I think I mean the other the other thing is that the machine perfusion, eight percentage of the livers that are transplanted in in the UK last year were machine perfused, and, and a fairly large number, about forty two percentage, were they're actually from Cambridge. So Cambridge is sort of well known for. I I was involved in the Organox uh, trial. I was part of. The, the people who actually put the uh, liver into the machine and also the kidney trials. So I think the, the number of active uh, pe people on the active transplant list has actually sort of uh, going down compared to what it was a few years ago. So they're not doing it because they're not uh, they're not confident or they're not skillful. They're not doing it because they just don't need to do it. You don't need to compromise. You don't need to put a donor to a to a risk other than the left lateral donor. You don't need to you don't need to take those risks at all because the disease donor numbers are good enough to actually. Uh, uh, solve the issues. And I think what I think what are the different options for Indian training? Um, I'm just I've just got a few more slides before I go into the survey. So just I think after MBBS, if you go, what are the pros? Uh, I think uh, so you start from the grassroots level, so you don't have any bad habits. So you get a complete package, which which I which I which I clarified before. But the cons is that you won't have the LDLT training. If you start if you from the beginning at the MBBS level, you're thinking that LDLT is your dream. So I think uh, probably you can stay in India. After MS, if you want to go, I think you can. Uh, you 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 might be you might have some surgical skills, but the problem is that you will still waste a few years, and you might be starting again from the scratch, from the grassroots level, which might which might mean that you actually end up losing a few years. But I, I think uh, the thing is that they might get some time to before getting used to the communication in the UK. Um, the main the main thing is the MCH, which is what people actually go into because there is an initiative to from the Royal College, which is the MTI scheme. There are there are some flaws in the scheme, which I think we'll probably comment on it later in the discussion. But I think. Um, after MCH, I think the people get ready. I think what I've seen is that although they have experience, they know what to do. They might have scrubbed in hundreds of uh, donor operations or a disabled operation. The problem is that uh, they, 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 they cannot cope with the fact that they will be treated as a junior because obviously any center you go to would want to watch you before they let you do. So they can have a low confidence during that time. They might feel that they can't operate. 
Um, I think one way to overcome that is because if you if you get the retrieval, retrieval part is not really uh, a consultant operation. You will get to do, you will get you will get trained in it because that should be your focus. And then slowly build up on kidney transplant, let's say pancreas transplant, and then build up to the liver transplant. So I think I mean. Um, so that 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 I think what you what the most important word here is the expectation. You need to be very clear with your expectation before you go to UK. Not expect that you will start to do a liver transplant in the first few months. I think uh, that's that's not going to happen. You might have to stay longer longer for that. Um, so I said that I, I surveyed a few of my uh, colleagues, some of my senior colleagues, uh, from from uh, from. Uh, our center and also from elsewhere. Um, so I've, I've just highlighted a few things. So I asked them two questions. First, I wanted to know why do you think uh, UK or abroad offers more than India in terms of training? And the second question I offer, I asked was, if given a chance, would you do any different? Would you train? Because they have, these are people who have already been to abroad, let's say UK or a US and have come back and, and, and working in India. Would they not go there? Because I think all 10 people, I have to say that all 10 people said that they would definitely uh, not do any difference. That means that they would they, they have done the right thing. I just highlighted a few things. Uh, this is I mean I don't want to really identify the surgeon for the, for the sake of it. I think this is a surgeon who's had a two years fellowship uh, in in uh, in a, in, a, in abroad, and I think they felt that it was very structured. Offers the basic minimum exposure at least, which is which is needed, and then subsequently you can you can you can enlarge on it when you come to India. Um, in India, I think the bad thing that they felt was the academics are not part of the agenda, and even the largest large volume transplant centers. They not give the hands-on exposure that might be that might be adequate, which is what the UK or the US program would do, because there is there is a minimum exposure. They are supposed to train in these things. If you are training, they have to train in you. They, I mean, in Cambridge, they had to give me the liver transplant. They couldn't stop me. Otherwise, I can I can raise the complaints again again against them. So that's how that's how it is. You're very well protected there. I think you've given a chance that some of the things that they said was training, training abroad is essential and not just in transplant and uh, and how to work in a system. It is, it is taught and in India still, they didn't, they, they, the medical training in India still does not bring in professionalism, which is, which is quite a, quite a sort of a strong uh, statement. I think another surgeon who's had a complete training in uh, UK, uh, so he felt that I think the training comes from more in UK, more from the renal transplant side, but, but it's more structured. Um, I, in India, the problem is that it all dep depends on the center and the volume, and and they also felt that uh, ideally everybody should have uh, exposure to both. I think that's 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 uh, that's a very important uh, statement. I feel. I think uh, what about another surgeon who's been completely trained in UK? They felt that uh, UK offers a solid solid broad base to narrow down for the rest of your life, which I agree completely because it gives you the complete package with which you can do you can do wonders. It's it, it's not only about surgical training; it's about, it's about a variety of things. Um, and they felt that you, I mean, uh, we all we all know that UK training has been a dominant force for transplantation in India. Let's take Professor Rayla or or uh, Subhash Gupta or uh, Professor Soin. All of them have had some UK training before uh, before 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 uh, coming to India. So that has that has been uh, the strong ethical point uh, for India in future. I think uh, this this surgeon has had uh, training not as not uh, not a complete training but a long transplant fellowship in a couple of couple of centers and they felt that the honest honest uh, honest in India it's on medical practitioner to follow the ethics which which I think needs to change in future <clears throat> and uh, and I think if if at all given a chance again this surgeon would be would, would want to go back and train in a, in a complete basic surgical training in UK, which I think is the very important statement made. Because if you go into UK as a non-trainee, which is what I told before, I think if you go as a non-trainee or if you're not in the system, then you can actually have a pretty hard time. So I think uh, might be important to actually go into a training system where you actually can dominate uh, the system rather than the system dominating you. Uh, so so a couple more slides on the previous other people's experience. This surgeon was uh, went through a year and and, uh, and he's, he's practicing uh, LDLT surgeon. So he felt that uh, it offers a good uh, retrieval surgery experience. I think as I pointed out, he, he did feel that I think you need to know what they call. So I think this surgeon, the second one, the Dr. F, is actually uh, fully trained in uh, UK, works in Pakistan. He felt that I think um, 
I think you get a much better exposure in the UK because of the rotation. Because, I mean, you, you saw my CV. I think I rotated to multiple hospitals. I actually changed to 16 houses, 16, uh, uh, houses before I actually settled down in Cambridge. And I, I went into sort of, uh, I worked with so many people. I have to say like more than 200, 200 consultant surgeons I worked in there. I think lots of, uh, they also felt that lots of time wasted in irrelevant skills because the training is long. That's, that's, a, big, that's a big problem. Um, uh, this is an anesthetist who was trained in, uh, trained completely in UK. They felt that you get a complete package, better work-life balance. In India, you have to be lucky to be in the right place, which, which again is a big problem because there are lots of centers. You don't, shouldn't get, you shouldn't lose your focus and go into smaller centers and suffer. Um, a few more things from conventional radiologist, hepatology colleague, and uh, somebody who, who's trained in medicine uh, in elsewhere. I think a philosophical point, which is I think uh, uh, foreign training gives you an and explore better, broader understanding of life and better aspects of life. Um, in terms of um, uh, the, the hepatologist, he felt that I think not just medical oriented training, it molds the person as a good clinician as well, which I think uh, we have to 100% agree because it gives you so many other perspectives. Um, in India, he felt that I think people rush to become a consultant. Quite an, quite after an MD or an MS, you become a consultant, which I think uh, should 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 change. Um, I think uh, so. I think I mean so. In summary, I think uh, I would want to sort of end my talk saying that uh, I think. Um, I, I, I mean, I don't want uh, anything that I've said jeopardize what, what I'm currently doing with, the, with the Professor Rela and the team. I've thoroughly enjoyed working with colleagues like Ashwin and, uh, Ashwin and Ram. Um, UK training is well-structured and streamlined, loads of opportunities to develop as a complete surgeon, um, which I hope uh, India, can, India can do that in the future. I think it needs a very sort of uh, an approach, I think, where, where people have to work hard towards it. Training period is long, which is, uh, I, I'm not denying it. I think, but it does give you a complete package. It, it, it shapes you as, the, it molds you as a person, which is what some of the other colleagues uh, felt, which is not only my view. And uh, for liver transplant, I think UK offers um, a comprehensive uh, program where you understand the structure systems and logistics better and, and, uh, and, and, and how the working of the system is. And I think training, training abroad should be made essential in the training system. So I think I want, I want to end the talk uh, from one of uh, one of the quotes from Professor Rela, I think when I was asking him why why actually what does uh, UK offer, he said that I, I think it teaches you the value of life, which I think I'm sure is lacking in India. I think you need to have a work-life balance, which is what UK does. Some of the pictures from the King's College in uh, in Cambridge, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And this is when I was going for a retrieval uh, to to Scotland and uh, sort of the, the famous view in a transplant uh, theater with four people wearing uh, loops. And this is when we are doing a transplant for a hereditary porphyria. And this is when you're using an angioscope in theater to look for any sort of traction injuries to the vessels. Uh, I would like to end my talk. Thank you. Uh, excellent talk, Abdul. I spent the last five minutes trying to figure out who those surgeons were, whose initials you had put up. Uh, <laughs> I could get most of them right, I'm sure. Um, uh, uh, again, uh, I would say excellent talk. Uh, you have uh, spoken about what uh, the, the the whole structured training is all about. Um, uh, if I can invite uh, Dr. Ilango and uh, Dr. Pari to give their perspective of training in the U.S. Uh, because as 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 we can see, we have spoken about India and the U.K. and U.K. is protracted about 12, 13 years of training. At least, if you do enter into a training job to start off with, that is, and 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 you know, uh, I don't mean to you know, uh, not uh, say that it, it it is great, but then there are quite a few who don't uh, enter uh, enter training course. So um, you have been lucky, and and you know, you have made use of all the opportunities given to you, and you have done really well. Um, again, excellent presentation, Abdul. If Thanks. I can, yeah, invite first Dr. Pari. Uh, followed by our own Dr. Ilango to to give their views about about training about transplant training in the US. Why they have an MC here? They decided on on transplant training in the US and not the uh, You know, if you can give your opinion, and and then uh, I would ask, I would request Dr. Uh, Wimman to give his opinion about uh, training in the Far East because he spent. Uh, fair amount of time in the Far East and in France as well. So if he can also share his opinions and then we can go on to the questions. Dr. Fari. Yeah, hi. Um, my, uh, congratulations to both the speakers. 
they have given some very strong and very valid points and uh, uh, extremely good points uh, so uh, my uh, congrats to them um, so my basic training uh, the basic as well as my uh, you know the uh, uh, superficial training in uh, mc surgical gastroenterology has been in india i have been trained with um, surgical gastroenterology department of uh, sanjay gandhi post postgraduate institute lucknow and i'd been to us for my uh, transplant training okay so uh, my decision to go to us for uh, transplant training was way back in uh, i would say 2005 or 6 when uh, the liver transplantation was still not well set up in india there weren't many training positions here so maybe that um, uh, was a major that the the time period was probably one of the important uh, reasons why i chose to go to us i may not do the same right now or like 5 uh, years ago so my, my decision was uh, based on those times in 2005 and 6 when uh, transplant liver transplant was still in infancy in india so the pros and cons about the i mean the uk training uh, abdul has given a very good perspective and um, i think uh, uh, american training uh, especially the basic training probably is maybe on the uh, I, i'm not sure about the basic training but i'm sure it's uh, also equally well structured and almost on the same lines um, so i'll just briefly touch upon the pros and cons of uh, training abroad from my perspective uh the the first first reason is uh, you know the first question is why did i go to us for training the reasons are one the hold on excuse me sorry so reasons were one times uh, we there was times when we used to think that uh, if you had to train in uh, uh, liver transplant you probably had to go to uk or us uh, that was the time when i decided so that was the most pr primary reason and two the glamour of uh, you know getting trained abroad getting trained abroad glamour of going to us or uk and seeing what's going on there because you don't know where the bar is you know we used to think that you know we read all the us and uk authors in the textbooks and you really don't know where their bar was so you really are curious to see whether you are how far you are from that bar they are set up so that was one of the curiosity was probably the most important reason why i probably thought i would go to us and see what is going on there but probably now you know the uh, bar uh, <laughs> indian uh, i really like the last slide of uh, ram kiran when he put on the uh, sarda statue you know that sums it all you know now the indian bar is probably set at a much higher uh, position there in than in us or uk and probably you know things are much different now so the uh, pros are that yes you get a very broad outlook you mature as a person okay you mature as a person just uh, forget about the transplantation so many things you pick up while being in uh, uk or us probably you know how you behave yourself on the road how you behave yourself in a crowd how you uh, carry yourself uh, with your colleagues and uh, you know the unknown persons the strangers patients everything you know it makes you mature as a person so you know you come back as a totally different person when you come back from us and it's much more structured i you have to accept that the uh, training back in us or uk is uh, much more structured you know you really have targets where the uh, programs have to really tick on and uh, have to complete otherwise uh, they don't uh, uh, exist to be training programs any anymore so they really are also under pressure to train you well i don't think that's uh, very true in india and then another important thing very strange is you know in indian centers uh, in us or uk centers there's no conflict of business interest unlike in uh, many centers in um, uh, india where uh, you know there may be uh, you know that subtle or undercurrent of conflict of business interest so that doesn't exist in uh, uk or us programs so the uh, training is really really it's only training and then obviously if somebody is interested in research higher possibilities of you landing up in a research job uh, if you go to the western training centers and then if somebody is interested is not very clear whether you know he wants to go into liver transplant or kidney transplant 
or pancreas transplant, then probably uh, he's better off uh, visiting US or UK for training because uh, the transplant training there is uh, multi-organ transplant. So I have known people who initially thought they were interested in uh, liver transplant, but uh, found more interest, uh, kidney transplant as more interesting and uh, branched out into the kidney transplant pool. So when somebody is not still clear whether, you know, he's uh, going to liver transplant or kidney transplant, then probably I would suggest him to go and give himself a shot in uh, US, uh, then uh, till things are much more clearer for him. And then if somebody is keen on settling down, invest probably that's a very good reason to go ahead and get trained in US or UK. Uh, obviously he's going to get a taste of how things are there and he can take a call and it's obviously much more easier for him to start things towards settling uh, in West. So these are the things that somebody, uh, these are the things that somebody has to consider when uh, he has to go for uh, training in US. More importantly, the training in US is uh, much more dramatic and, uh, you know, it's uh, in the sense that uh, the first day of my training, you know, uh, there was a, a kidney transplantation case and then I had to, I scrubbed in as the assistant to the surgeon there and I never done a vascular anastomosis till that time there. The first day, the very first day, the very first case, you know, I was given um, I was asked to do it, uh, you know, vascular anastomosis. I admitted that I never done a vascular anastomosis, but they said, you know, they egg me on to come and try it. You know, I am there. If you're not able to do it, we'll take over. Doesn't never, I don't think it happens in um, uh, uh, India, uh, at least uh, till this time. So the amount of training, the hands-on training you get in uh, American Center is unbelievable. That's, uh, you know, it's, you have to see it to believe that. Uh, the amount of vascular training, especially the vascular training, and uh, you know the that's uh, dramatic. You know you got to see that to believe. So that is one important aspect of American training because you just have two years, and then you have to be happy that you had a good training because you are being asked, you are being interviewed by the board of either the fellowship board or whatever board is supervising the training that whether you had a good training, whether you are happy with the training. So that is very important. If you are unhappy with the training, you know that uh, the program may be questioned and the uh, fellowship may be closed down. So it's uh, really the hands-on is much more there. And in two years, I'm not very sure any center in India would give so much of hands-on training in the two years. But because in many other centers, what happens is it takes time, longer time, uh, to, you know, uh, for them to assess you, for them to, because there are so many other seniors, you know, for them to uh, build some uh, confidence in you to, before giving the crucial parts like vascular anastomosis and other things. So there are a lot of pros uh, about training in US. The cons are, you know, it's a very long route. You know, you know, you got to take a uh, uh, bunch of exams, uh, you know, step one, two, uh, you know, two uh, clinical skills and several other things. The paperwork is really horrifying and then it's pretty costly. You got to spend a lot before, you know, actually uh, have, uh, before you can actually start off the training. And uh, then the most important thing is when you have to come back, when you actually come back, you... Uh, come back and see that you know you have to join a program at much lower level uh, than you actually uh, intend to start off with because there are already so many people around here and then when you come back you are anyway a new entrant you are a new new kid on the block and then you have to start at a much lower level than you are expecting itself to start and then the most important thing is uh, there's no ldlt and as you know in india it's 95 percent ldlt still and then when you come back from uh, UK or US, uh, you know, there's no LDLT training as a part of your, uh, you know, uh, training majority of the centers. Most of the centers do not have a very good LDL, LDLT uh, exposure. And then many of the centers do not have a HPV center, HPV surgery exposure too. Because the HPV surgery may be a separate uh, program department in that particular center and then not every center, not every uh, transplant program may uh, get you to have a good HPV surgery exposure. So, but unlike, I think most of the centers in uh, large volume centers in India have a, a pretty good HPV surgical exposure too. So I think if somebody is keen on also having a good uh, HPV surgery exposure, then probably you know, not many uh, American centers would uh, offer you that. So, uh, to coming back to the question, is it essential? 
uh, to go to US or UK or any Western center for uh, training? The answer is a clear no. It is not essential. Things were different when I went to, uh, when I decided to go to US for training. It is not essential now. The fulcrum or the, uh, the balance is tilted to the East and to India now. We are having centers with much better uh, 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 which much better HPB and living donor liver transplantation work going on. You are going to get a fantastic exposure in India too. The uh, experience in US, UK is going to be good, but whether it's essential, it's a big no from as well, especially from my side. But if you still go there, you're going to have a, you are not going to regret it. You are not going to regret it. You're going to have a fantastic time there. You're going to have a lot of uh, learning and training. But the thing is, when you come back, you're probably, your expectations are not going to be, you know, the, you're probably, uh, what you expect, you're probably not going to get here because you're again going to start off at a much lower level than you expect yourself to start off at. So that, that, that's what my perspective is. Love to hear what uh, Ilungo has got to say. Uh, over to you, Dr. Ilungo. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> so, um... I did a longer route than Pari. Um, I was trained in smaller hospitals in uh, India. I trained from Madurai Medical College for my MBBS and I did my MS from Toronto Medical College and then took a long seven year hiatus because I had, uh, I had to settle down with family. There were uh, much pressures on a young surgeon. So I, I was basically a podiatric surgeon and um, I did a lot of work in endoscopy um, I was a full-time endoscopist and I used to do a lot of imaging in the, I was a sonologist who did a bit of interventional radiology uh, for seven years. So after that, um, I decided to pursue my love. So when my, um, when my family was a little settled, I took up GI surgery. I qualified to do my MCH in Madras Medical College, a large volume center. Uh, I was with uh, Dr. H. Ramesh for a brief time. So my interest was not focused on liver transplant at that point of time. My interest was mainly in pancreatic surgery and uh, uh, diseases. Um, I mean, uh, pancreatic diseases. So that was my main focus. In 2009, I was with uh, Dr. Ratnasamy. He, he was telling me that I should go for liver transplant training. I was like a pauper, but they, by the time of, I was a non-service PG and I think I was paid 8,000 rupees at that time per month. So I had accumulated a lot of uh, debt during that time. My wife had um, joined DM gastroenterology at that point of time. So I had to support myself. So just for that, I had to work independently as a GI surgeon and I had to survive those years. Um, during those years, I felt that um, after listening to my teacher, uh, I felt the need to train further in liver surgery. Um, so I had to take the long, longer route. So I wrote the USMLE steps out of the money I saved during those earning months. And I traveled to US and um, took a fellowship at his advice. Um, the first application was to Mayo and uh, Dr. Chuck Rosen was surprised to see all the things I have done. He said, um, why don't you apply here for fellowship? I said, I, I want to see how the life of a liver transplant is. Some events that happened during the time uh, of my training, I saw the procurements and I was not very comfortable with brain death protocols, uh, probably arising from my misunderstanding. So I took some more years to actually decide to go to liver transplantation. So it was 2014 by the time I went there, but uh, I was really lucky to train in uh, Pittsburgh. The, the winds have changed, were changed at that time. Uh, Dr. Humar was in charge, living donor program was just picking up. Um, I was learning new lessons as the whole uh, program was, uh, was focused on developing that living donor program. Um, so I was lucky. I did about 155 kidney transplants in the first year. In about six months, five transplants back to back. It was back breaking work, um, uh, 110 hours plus hours per work week. Um, most of the time I was spending in the hospital, but it was well worth it. Every hour I spent there, I liked it. My first independent kidney was day 60 of uh, joining the program. And the first anastomosis, like Pari said, was on day three. I refused to do the first two days. I said, I have never seen a kidney transplant. What I would do is I would expose the vessels 
and I would wait for somebody else to sew in the kidney. But by day 60, I was good enough that I was doing most of the anastomosis uh, in kidneys. And um, on the first pancreas transplant, I was trying to stand very quietly. And Mark Studeman said, uh, Ilango, you're trying to show off saying that you can do the uh, pancreas transplant from, from, from your side. And I said, I've never done one. He said, yeah, come and come in and do it. That's, that's why we are here. That is how open the program was. And uh, it's, it was the same with liver transplant as well. Uh, but uh, at that point, uh, Dr. Hughes had a rule. Only one fellow was allowed to scrub in. There were only two people operating on the, on the patient. Uh, we had a good time. Now, what he expected in return was a long working hour. I was on call every day for one whole year. And at the end, I took a 10-day break to take my children outside uh, Pittsburgh for the first time. So it was, uh, it was hectic work. But uh, I thoroughly enjoyed everyone, uh, every, every hour of that. I still maintain that extended mentorship with Dr. Humar. If I ever have a doubt, regardless of the time of the night or day, I call him up and I share the pictures, pathology words, and I still share um, uh, an extended mentorship with most of them. What was very, very important is not how I did the anastomosis. They trained me in a process of, I mean, I was never trained in vascular surgery. I was one of those unlucky ones whose cardiothoracic surgery uh, posting was ruined by some problem in the operation theater. So I had no cardi cardiothoracic or vascular experience during my entire training phase, but um, I made up for it during transplantation. They trained me in every bit, every process, the end to end in different angles, different sizes, uh, number of vessels, um, pantaloon anastomosis, every step, Dr. Humar and uh, his team, they were there, they trained me in that. So I really enjoyed every bit of it. And now when I face a new problem, all I don't have to do is to look at another problem. I know the, how the process is solved. I sit down, think about it and solve the problem. I was also lucky to work as a part of the living donor transplant program. Um, obviously there was no big hands-on experience. I think I was the only fellow in that entire program who was uh, given a high dissection in a living live donor uh, surgery right at the uh, last couple of uh, days of my fellowship. So they like me and I think um, I was able to reciproc reciprocate that love and affection. And I still believe, and I tell the youngsters, uh, you can learn a lot from a structured program, but you have to utilize it. Um, you have to utilize it. It's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of sacrifice on the side of your family. Uh, working for 110 hours a week consistently for a year is not easy. People can easily break down. You're not going to have family support. You, you probably will uh, live as a nuclear family. Uh, your wife, a lot of fellowship uh, interviews uh, come around this question. Um, is your wife, did your wife agree to your transplant fellowship? I didn't understand this initially. I mean, why would an Indian wife not agree? You, know? you just make the decision and then push it on her. But at the end of the fellowship, I realized that uh, some, some of the uh, transplant uh, stuff can really ruin your personal life that hard but still after me and my wife finished those fellowship years um, I still consider it one of the uh, some of the best years of my life uh, I have enjoyed every bit of it and I would still recommend that for a complete training program you should go to the US probably I was lucky on the LDLT front that I had a good exposure but um, I think it is catching up in US you will st still get a, a, a good fellowship Vinay Kumaran is already there I think the tides will change for living donor transplantation in the U.S. as well. But I have, um, I do not consider training in India less as well, but it's just that it takes a longer time. You will never be given an anastomosis probably for two years, three years into your training program so that you have to spend a longer time to do that. And you probably have to take a lot of personal effort to get a structured training on your own. So these are problems. If you have no access to those kind of uh, 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 books uh, and the experiences, it is very difficult. I also had the advantage of a lab, which was open 24 hours. So whenever I had a break, I had, uh, uh, I had a free time. I could go to the lab and uh, try something which I would never be able to try in a clinical scenario. So I, I had a beating heart machine in the Veterans Administration Hospital at Pittsburgh. So I, had, I got the access, it is free. 
and I had a lot of artificial vessels and I used to try a lot of anastomosis on them. So uh, it's not just that your number is, yeah, I, I roughly did close to about 2,000, 3,000. I wasted most of the vessels because it was considered a waste. But those advantages you will never get in India. For training, every day I would pick up 10 or uh, 10 or 15 packs of six or proline but just not tying in Pittsburgh. Uh, Umar was very fond of teaching me. So we used to do that in his office whenever he was free. So those things cannot happen in India. Um, I would still recommend a youngster to spend those two years to kickstart his transplant experience. That is, that is my take on this. Thank you. Are you muting Ashwin? I'm muted Ashwin. Sorry, um, uh, excellent arguments by you, Dr. Elango. Um, uh, if if I may ask uh, Dr. Wimmel to give his uh, opinion with regards to training in the Far East and in France as well, and and as to what his thoughts are uh, with regards to uh, training overseas. No, uh, thank you, Ashwin. Uh, actually, I loved the talk of uh, Ram and Abdul. You, I think you would have people would have made up their mind. I'm just trying to, you know, tell what happened to me, so that uh, they will understand the difficulties of going far east and then uh, the amount of uh, exposure you get and what what you're going to do after that. It is very important because uh, when I finished my undergraduate, post graduation, and MCH in all three in Stanley. Actually, it is a government medical college, so I did everything there. So I did my, uh, after finishing my MCH, I joined there as a, you know, assistant professor, and then I was there for four or five years. My interest was only in GI surgery at that time, and uh, maximum I thought I would do pancreas and liver because that was being done at that time. So we never did transplants till like 2010, maybe 2010, 9, 10 or so, first transplant. First time we, we did a transplant, it was uh, with Professor Indran and one Dr. Swaminathan. I think everybody know who Dr. Swaminathan is in this forum. He's uh, currently in Gem Hospitals and he's a lead transplant surgeon there. And he, he came back from US, he was trained in Iowa. The way he helped us do the surgery and the way he was confident in the vascular anastomosis really tells us what training you get in the US. So even after that, I was not much interested in transplant because we knew what happened there and then how it's going to progress. And then it was in 2010 when Professor Rela used to come to take classes there. We got really interested in LDL. So it was very interesting. The science was interesting. The science was very interesting, actually. He took two classes. One was basic surgical anatomy and two was uh, the management in the post -op. The science was interesting. Then we thought maybe we should pursue this. And we were doing some transplants. The number was less. So we thought initially I went to Hong Kong. Hong Kong was with Professor Fan. It was a three months more of an observership that told us um, it is a perfect HPV transplant unit. You have uh, two units. The one is pure HPV and one is pure transplant. And then uh, and uh, they each faculty has some period stints in both the uh, sections and there will be one head for each who don't change sides and there will be a professor managing and it is a perfect unit and uh, uh, transplant would start at 8 in the morning and uh, my last bus is at 11 30 in the night i don't know what is happening now when i come out of the hospital they are still doing their biological anastomosis on the recipient from 8 in the morning and 7.30 in the night. I thought this is not the life that I'm going to pursue. So I thought maybe I will uh, do HPV, I'll limit myself to HPV. But surgery was good, the results were good, but the time they took was enormous at that time. I'm talking about 2010, 2009, in that time. It was in 2012 when I went to Korea. I thought maybe this is a day procedure. You start in the morning. I think by evening you can finish this surgery. So I spent some time in Korea. It was more of I was with Professor uh, David Kwan, who is now in Cleveland. He was initially doing his laparoscopic HPV, 
uh, in uh, Samsung Medical Center. So I was very much interested. I was following everywhere, and then he was doing there. The liver numbers are more, so they were doing more liver, uh, all this uh, cirrhotic livers, normal livers, all resections, laparoscopic. He was trying out initially. He never did a uh, laparoscopic donor when I was there. So after all this training in 2012, I felt I needed more training. So that is that sums up everything. If you go to Far East, you get more to observe. Maybe you will it will broaden your perspective. That is mainly because I was not a fully you know operating HPP surgeon at that time in 2012. Maybe the first anastomosis I did. Vascular anastomosis I did was assisted by Dr. Pari here. So it was in 2015. So it was it tells me tells you I, I missed something in, in between. After that, after coming back in 2012, I joined the uh, Soins unit. I was I did a fellowship, proper fellowship for a year. And um, it was really an eye opener because it is a well organized fellowship. You you have your own jobs, you, you need to do the certain duties, you need to do you have a rota where uh, you have to rotate between the intensive care, the operating uh, units, and also the outpatient departments. And it tells you the, it gives you the overall spectrum of transplants so from getting a patient worked up to getting them discharged and following them up. It's uh, it was a, a very good program. It is till now it is a very good program. So I feel. Um, even after that, so it was only one year stint. I was I initially went there for a long haul, and because of some personal reasons, I need to come back to Chennai. And then I I was there. Uh, I was freelancing for some time, and then uh, then I thought like transplant. Okay, let me see do some more on laparoscopic HPV. And that time, uh, um, um, Dr. David was uh, he was with uh, Professor Gaye in uh, France. So he, he offered me a six months uh, fellowship there. And it is uh, only an OR fellowship. It's like an operating room fellowship. You need, you do research, you go only to the operating room, help him in the operating room and uh, you don't see patients. You're not supposed to see patients in France, especially where in that particular hospital because it was a private hospital. It was a medium volume center. They did around uh, three or four liver resections uh, a week and then uh, he used to do general surgery also, so that was good for me. So, and after coming back and joining uh, uh, Miot with uh, Dr. Pari and Dr. Surendran, it actually, it, my proper transplant career began, began at that time as doing, uh, you know, doing stuff. It's not like the others. You, you, could, you should have heard from them that they did, uh, from day one, they were doing uh, vascular anastomosis. For me, it took from, uh, I graduated uh, by MCH in 2007. I wanted to do transplants and I left Stanley in 2018, 2012. So from 2012, it took me three or four years before I did my first vascular anastomosis. So if you really, to sum up, if you want to go to Far East, it is only after you, you know, you become a little proficient and you want to fine tune your skills. You want to know what is happening there. And, uh, and I, I would suggest it is the only suggestion. It's not for, for all people. For now, for, for example, let me tell you. The, of the two people talk, I loved the way Abdul has used his time. It is fantastic. I think he is a role model for everybody. But if you ask me, whose route will you follow? I would follow Ram's route. <laughs> I would be, if you ask me, what would you be? If you given the same chance, I would take Ram, Ram route and I would be Ram. So this is my sum. I would sum up there. So I know Pari because Pari and Ilongo, I work with them. I learn a lot from them. So it would be, I would say of these two, I would still, I would love to be Ram rather than Abdul. So I find Abdul is like a role model. I, I really admire the way he has used his time. And then this is how one should be. But if you ask me, my personal, I would be Ram anytime, any day. So I would, I would end there. Thank you. Uh, excellent um, points made by uh, you, Dr. Vimal. Uh, I think you told me the same thing about 10 years ago as well, saying, um, you know, if you're in India, it's, it's, it's a slow but sure uh, route up. But, you know, if you go overseas, you come uh, and somewhere in between, but then, you know, you are always not sure whether, where you're joining, how you're joining in. 
um, and the uh, other important point, which I think is is also a take home message, is that um, you know uh, the Far East is ma mainly to fine tune and to observe up after you are a proficient transplant surgeon yourself. Um, uh, Ashwin, if I can just interrupt, yes, can we get uh, uh, Professor in here and uh, Dr. Vinay? Uh, Kilango, are they on the are they there on the online? Yeah, if you have something more to say. Ashwin, carry on, but uh, I'll be glad if the, they come in as well, chip in. Sure, uh, I'll, uh, I just uh, wanted a few words from uh, Dr. Vinay Kumaran, who's also in the audience. And then I'll have a quick word with Prof if he's free and then maybe uh, he can... Yeah, I'm free as well. Let Vinay say something. Oh, excellent, Prof. Thank you so much for joining in. Yeah. Good evening, Prof. Good evening, good evening. Hi. Everyone, sorry, I joined quite late um, in the middle of clinic. Uh, but uh, uh, when I came to the US for a fellowship, there was no training in India for liver transplant, so I had no options. And uh, when I returned from here and joined Gangaram in Delhi, uh, I had learned how to look after sick patients, but I did not know anything about how to do a living donor liver transplant. So I basically learned how to do a transplant in India, not in the US. And I can tell you that the fellows I have trained in India are better trained than anyone I'm training over here. So in this day and age, I don't think there's any reason for anyone to go abroad for a transplant unless you're thinking of moving there or you want to figure out DCD or you want to figure out disease donor transplantation. But uh, realistically, uh, there's no reason I can think of uh, to go for an inferior training compared to what you get in India. Uh, extremely interesting uh, viewpoint uh, on, on the training. It's quite in contrast to what Dr. Pari and Dr. Elam uh, were talking about. Um, if I can have a Prof to say a few words as to what his opinion and what his uh, take home message would be. Prof? Um, <laughs> thank you. I Thank you for organizing this, Ashwin. I thought um, it's really wonderful uh, to hear so many different perspectives. And I, I really can understand each one of them, including what Vinay Kumaran said at the end. I, 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 do, I do believe in terms of um, the higher level training, um, uh, I agree that the, the United States is probably better. I've spoken to many, many people who have said that the hands-on training is um, is really good there, but uh, Vinay is slightly had a slightly different opinion. Um, but uh, Abdul, I can tell you, Abdul, I I've learned more about you now. <laughs> you know, going through your CV carefully, um, I think you have made a fantastic use of your time, and I have to say, you're probably an exception. Um, I can't believe that every uh, UK trainee has come through uh, as successfully as you have done. Um, so you're not um, a, a classical example of a UK trainee either. So um, you, you are an exception. Um, I loved um, Vimal Raj's comment. Um, actually, he said everything that was true about going to the Far East. Far East, you go there when you are a very seasoned transplant surgeon, You've been trained in the UK or US, which is what I got out of uh, the Far East. I went for a very short time to the Far East, only to understand how things are being done and how they do it. And uh, other than the technical aspects and the inspiration that you get out of how well they operate and how resilient they are and how they can start in the morning and finish at the... I, this was my experience even in, in, in Japan when I went to uh, uh, see Professor Tanaka um, no operation fish finished before 8 p.m. and I left when before the bile duct anastomosis was done. And I, when I went there, I was a very seasoned surgeon. I was never used to operating that many long hours to complete a transplant. So ev ev everything that you said um, um, was ringing a bell with me. And what was beautiful about what you said is, if you were given an opportunity, you would want to be training in India fully like Ram has done rather than like what Abdul has done. And, and I think that finishes off, it finished off everything beautifully, actually. 
Um, I trained in the UK and um, um, I had fantastic opportunities only because I went into transplantation at a very, very early stage of transplantation. I went into transplantation in Kings when Kings had just started transplant two years before then. So um, I, it was an exceptional time for me. Um, we were talking about Roger Williams and how he, uh, Roger Williams dead now. He died two days ago. Um, and how he put his trust in me and uh, gave, gave me equal opportunities that he gave Casey Tan as well as Nigel Eaton. Um, that was a completely different time. We were um, at the beginning of transplantation. We were going through the developments in transplantation. Uh, but I can tell you, we have trained many surgeons, many, many surgeons from all around Europe. Um, and I did not find them bright or I did not find them as good as the trainees that we have in India currently. Um, I think um, every trainee that uh, I have, um, I don't want to say is like Abdul actually, um, that if I had Abdul as a trainee, trainee in the UK, I would have been extremely pleased. And, um, and I think uh, most of the guys here who've done their MCH in All India Institute or in big institutions, um, I never had the quality of doctors that I have currently with me when I was working in the UK for sure. Um, yes, I think uh, the training may be a little bit slow in India. Uh, currently, uh, when I see what Abdul has been saying or what you say about the, the U.S. training, I think in the U.S. for the fellowship training, there is a, a pressure on the, uh, on the trainees as well because they are being assessed by the trainees. The trainers are being assessed by the trainees, as you said, and therefore there is a huge pressure to get them to operate. Um, uh, but in the UK, I think the stress is more on um, the general principles of um, transplantation, general principles of how best to run a unit, how best to look after a patient. I think it is, um, um, it, it's, it's a roundabout way and the, the technical aspects, I think I saw that in the comment as well, the technical aspects of training somebody, the stress is not so huge. I think I, I one of the criticisms I have about um, UK is, um, um, if you excel in a field, it's not as much recognized as, as it is if you're safe. Uh, I think they promote um, somewhat um, mediocrity, actually. Um, outstanding situation is not that well, that well recognized in the UK. This is my own view, actually. Um, um, I know outstanding people always come up, but I don't think they are actually that well recognized in the UK. So safety is what is um, uh, seen as very important in the UK rather than uh, people who take a bit of risk and do, do fantastic quality work. So I, I, my uh, final uh, comment would be that the, uh, the training in India is any day as good as the training in the Western world. Um, and um, if you want to be, become a person who's confident and who can deal with people who feels are not inferior to anywhere, any person in the world. I think uh, the Western training helps uh, enormously. But uh, you also have many Indian surgeons who are in the international stage um, are being looked at very prominently, um, you know, in, in some specialties like laparoscopic surgery and all of that. So I don't think it's entirely true that uh, you won't be that confident if you don't go abroad either. Um, so I, my final comment would choose your place as well. Uh, it may be a long training process in India because a lot of the training high volume happens in the private sector and therefore the trainers also have the responsibility that uh, the operations have to go well. Um, that is also there and that's why. And the, and the number of people who are training in India are also very enormous. Even in our own unit, there are many, many people who are uh, coming up the ladder, even though it is taking a longer time for them to go up the ladder. I'm pretty sure they will go up the ladder and feel confident to practice on their own in the future. That's all I have to say. Thank you so much for the uh, for your viewpoint, Prof. Um, uh, if I may just add uh, one thing. Uh, actually, I would like to ask your opinion on that as well. And Dr. Vinay uh, uh, is 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 what uh, was told to me by Dr. Pata about uh, about. 10 years ago, maybe 12 years ago, when I was 
He said, you go where the wife goes. Uh, and and uh, it is the way to keep the family happy. Uh, what is your opinion about that? I mean, I know how we are, but, um, you know. Uh, what, what me? Staying away from the wife? No. <laughs> No, uh, uh, how do you keep it going? How, what is the secret to, 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 to having a successful transplant career and a successful family, uh, you know, in the background? Uh, also? Yeah, the, the, the transplant career, my wife was very understanding anyway, because when I first went to King's, um, I was just married and um, I had a really tough time. Um, I really hated that job. Everybody said how they enjoyed the job. Uh, my job was hell for the first year because um, I worked for a very tough uh, boss, um, probably abused actually in terms of um, uh, how I was being treated. I was treated like dirt actually uh, in the first year of my training. So it's not been a very happy situation for me. Um, and I was newly married and um, I had a very Western prospect, you know, perspective of life at that time. Uh, I, an arranged marriage, an Indian wife, I had a very tough time. Um, but she was very understanding and I'm extremely grateful to her. Um, the, so we, we got on very well after that, once, once we had the kids and I was, I was there. Uh, but um, the, the problem came is the decision to move to India was a huge, huge problem for my wife. Uh, my wife had always said that we should go back to India in the early days when I had no way, no idea in my mind that I would ever come back to India. But when I made a decision to come back to India, initially only for a short time, my wife was dead against it. And, um, and one, of the, one of the concerns that I had, I mean, maybe you're going to face that. My do younger daughter almost accused me of abandoning our family to leave to India, which was one of the most difficult times for me really, because uh, my first daughter at least went to university when I left, but my second daughter was still in school. Uh, she didn't finish school. She had another three to four years uh, or five years at school, and then she was going to choose to do her university or wherever she was to go. And I was not participating. I wasn't part of it. That was a huge guilt for me. And I think they probably now understand why I've done that and the reasoning behind it. But that has not been easy and uh, they were not going to come, come back to India with me and I did not expect them to and it would have been very unfair for me to think that my children will follow me to India. Thank you, Prof. Uh, what, what about you, Dr. Vinay? Um, you seem to be taking your family uh, from the US to India and then India back to US. Did they uh, is his family to... taking him is the other way. <laughs> <laughs> periods of uh, overlap so there have been periods when they've been in the US and I've been in India and vice versa so you basically need a very tolerant wife there's no no other way to to do it Ashwin can we take some questions from the audience if any 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 of them have a question because it is a very thorough thorough discussion there can't be a better discussion than it but if anybody it is open uh, if anybody wants to raise a point or uh, one, uh, one of the best uh, group of faculty transplant uh, you have here. Yeah. Anyone wants to come up and ask a question? Yeah, Ashwin, back to you. After, after, uh, after what was summarized by Prof, I don't think there's anything yeah. else anybody could have. Uh, Ashwin, Dr. Uh, yeah, Ilunga, sure. Adar Big Bay uh, wants to ask a question. Yeah, please go ahead. You're muted. You, you. Oh. Yeah, yes. One, one minute. You have to unmute. Please unmute. Okay, I'm a general surgeon from Nigeria. Um, I my international exposure is only in. In three months observership in the U.S. and three months in Gangaram with uh, Dr. Samira Nandi. Uh, actually, I don't think there's anything that the training or surgery in India is lower in any way than that in the U.S. What and uh, I, I want to do HPB stroke liver transplant surgery because that is not offered here in Nigeria at all. 
and I would like uh, further training. But whenever I discuss with my friends, including my the former fellows in Tagangaram, is that there's no really structured training, as has been noted by the former speakers. So I think India should focus on this structured, structured training that can have limited time so that you can get the maximum out of that. I, for instance, would love to come to India, spend a, a year or two, and be able to be independent, to be independ an independent surgeon, HPV surgeon after that. But from the discussion, I see that that is not possible. So the big boss is there. I think it's important for you to develop a structured program that those of us in lesser developed countries can even take advantage of. Thank you for the discussion. Can you ask Prof to respond to that? Yes, um, <clears throat> I, I, I think, see, part of the problem may be that um, those of us uh, who trained in surgery, um, like me, for example, uh, didn't go through a very structured training. Uh, what, what we did is, and what we still follow, and many people follow, is what is called an apprenticeship. Um, so most of the training in India currently is an apprenticeship and, uh, and we, we think that um, um, maybe very arrogantly most of us think that um, uh, it's a privilege for these boys to be working for us and learning the process. Um, maybe that attitude should change. Um, maybe we should have um, um, at least adapt some sort of um, uh, a system uh, like the US system uh, in order to train people uh, during their two years of fellowship. But um, I have a problem with that as well, is if we have, um, see, in my unit, we have people, and uh, when we find people who are good, um, I try and retain them. And, uh, um, and we have enormous number of people who stay back. I mean, I love to have them. A part of the reason is me that um, uh, we retain a lot of them. Um, but if you, I, I'm not sure whether if you train somebody for two years and teach them how to do a vascular anastomosis or if they can do a perfectly good vascular anastomosis, they're still suitable to go out into the open and start a unit and perform extremely well because liver transplantation is not only a surgical training. I mean, there is a lot, there is a lot more in that, looking after very sick patients. Um, in, in fact, building a unit with uh, high-level intensive care, intensivists, anesthetists, and epidemiologists. Um, and, and there is a, a, a huge lot of all of this involved in the training in liver transplantation. That's why the, the UK training is probably good in those, in those aspects. Um, but what do we do to all of these people? Uh, you train them, have a structured training for two years post MCH, and they can actually put in a liver very successfully. And when they go out, what do they do? Um, do we have huge number of small units, each doing 10 transplants, 15 transplants a year? Um, and will they all be able to offer uh, transplantation at the same level? Is, is all a problem, I think. Um, I think currently, um, it's, it is probably better that um, um, any unit that starts transplant at least does about 50 liver transplants to sustain themselves and to train. Um, and maybe I'm wrong, but um, I feel that if we have many trainees like that and we let them go after two years of uh, being able to operate, uh, many of them will fall out and won't be continuing in transplantation. So that is a problem. So it is important that uh, we, after the two years of training, they go into a sort of an apprenticeship at a junior level as a consultant level and help to run much larger units. And in that process, they continue to learn. So it took 12 years, um, uh, Abdul said, for him to train uh, in a higher level training. And maybe 12 years is not necessary. I do believe two years is definitely not enough. The, the Mahesh? Uh, yes, sir. Hello. What, what is your question? Uh, yes, uh, yes, sir. Uh, two questions, sir. Uh, I'm an MCH first year resident, sir, uh, from Tanjavur Medical College. So, first two question is, how should I prepare myself to, go, to get eligible to transplant fellowship both in India and UK, sir? Um, the second question is, uh, if I'm taking a liver transplant as my career, should I give up entire luminal GA surgery? Uh, 
uh, should I restrict only to liver transplant? Is it possible to oh, uh, is it possible to do both uh, liver transplant and HDA surgeries? Thank you, sir. Ashwin, you need to direct the question to the appropriate. Yeah. Ashwin, Ashwin, you need to answer the first question. How does one prepare himself to become a trainee for liver transplantation? You answer that. I answer the second one. Okay, Professor. Sure. Um, uh, it's like this. Now, um, uh, the aim of this talk and the debate is not as much like I said earlier. But, but uh, what you need is an intent. Uh, it uh, it is not a short game. It, uh, it is a game for life. It's like what uh, once uh, uh, Vimal told me. It, uh, it, uh, it is like holding on to a tiger's tail. You catch it, you can't leave it. And if you leave, it's rather unlikely that you're going to go anywhere else. And it might help you with, with other HPV surgery and all that. But, yeah, but once you try liver transplant, to stick by it. I mean, that, that is the first thing. You need to have intent. And more, more important than intent uh, is that you need to be persistent. You need to work on it. USMLE is not a short uh, time goal. So, so is usually like what Abdul showed is not a short time goal. Even in India, it's not. I mean, really speaking, four or five years you work in a unit, you're still at a junior consultant level. So, so it's not a short-term goal. You need to invest in it for life. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, you were asking about uh, whether you can remain a luminal surgeon after training in liver transplant surgery. Was, wasn't that the question? Um, I, I, I would have loved to be a general surgeon, really, in, even though I was a liver transplant surgeon. But... Um, once uh, you uh, gain prominence, I think uh, you will get labeled. Um, after that, I think it's very difficult for you to uh, be considered as a luminal surgeon, I think. I mean, it depends on how successful you are in the field of liver transplantation. I told you, I think in my talk, I mean, I was, um, in fact, in King's, um, I was an HPV surgeon in charge of HPV surgery, not liver transplantation. Uh, my interest for over five years was building pancreatic surgery in King's College Hospital, but not one person in India would recognize me as a pancreatic surgeon. Um, so you, you will be labeled and it's, it's impossible to, um, um, to continue to do. I mean, even today in India, I see that uh, if somebody has a um, hepatocellular carcinoma, they will go and see an oncologist and an oncosurgeon, a cancer surgeon, because the specialization in India has gone in that route. A cancer surgeon knows better about uh, HCC than a liver surgeon. So this is a fight that you'll have to put up, even though you have trained in MCH um, gastroenterology and you believe you are a very good human luminal surgeon. Once you get into HPV and transplantation, you might be labeled as an HPV and transplant surgeon by your own colleagues in luminal surgery. And you may not be able to continue to practice. But who will stop you if you are successful there? and want to continue to practice. Um, maybe what you need to do is to take laparoscopic surgery and then call yourself a laparoscopic luminal surgeon and that will sort you out. Uh, everything is about how you label yourself that you're going to be successful in the chosen field. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So regarding the first question, sir, how should I prepare myself means like uh, what criteria they can take into like uh, count uh, whether when they are selecting a fellows uh, into their curriculum, sir, like in India or in abroad. I, I think it's like any other uh, selection process, really. I mean, if I'm choosing um, a candidate for training in uh, transplant surgery, um, I'd want to see how smart they are and how they come across as an individual to me. Um, and, and academic performance is also important, obviously. Um, if you have an interest and um, if you come across as a very smart individual and if you have made use of your time, if you have, you know, maybe shown some interest in some publication, but they're not important. If I see someone, I find that they, they appear very smart. I'd want to have, that's all I, that's all the criteria that I apply. Because you've been chosen, you've done your MCH and you must be anyway good in what you do. You must be hardworking. You've demonstrated all of that. I don't need to look at anything. 
you know you come and you come across as a very sensible all rounded guy who is smart that's enough for me thank you thank you very much dr patta uh, we we have been at it for the last 2 hours i am not sure. <laughs> i know but that's a very intense uh, very focused discussion yeah. uh, in a very very meaningful and i think one of the best discussions i've seen on this platform and it's so, so nice so any any arul kumar you have a question arul kumar yeah uh the normal questions i think it's been a wonderful session and uh, Uh, thank you so much ashwin to bring so many luminaries together and get the, get it whole thing in the right perspective i think is a very very useful discussion to all the members of learning journal search yeah i thank everyone and back to you ashwin uh, special thanks to prof for joining in and and to dr vinay kumaran as well and also all the uh, uh, esteemed panelists dr elango dr vimmal and dr pari for sharing what the ground realities are the aim, the main aim was to was to show that you know it is not necessarily that the grass is greener on the other side and you have actually missed out on something it is just to present both sides of the picture so that you know uh, each person wh whoever is aspiring to be a transplant surgeon can actually uh, make an informed uh, you know choice uh, with regards to what they want to do for their for the rest of their life uh, i would uh, end the, the uh, debate with this is there any further qu comments from dr patta yeah fine fine that's fine now um, uh, yeah uh, what to be your next uh, program the agenda and when is it uh, like it? so the uh, ne next uh, talk is is uh, is to take this further like you know one of the main uh, points which was raised was ldlt versus ddlt uh, in india and you know having training uh, of ddlt or uh, in the west as compared to ldlt here so we going to have a talk by one of my uh, surgical colleagues dr shetty who is going to speak on ldlt versus ddlt and how we are doing with it uh, yeah. it will be on friday at 8 pm okay thank you thanks everyone and i think uh, we had a very thank very fruitful evening thank you thank you very much